بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته أهلا وسهلا welcome back in this video we're going to look at the case or the cases of marrying two sisters at the same time the first thing to bear in mind is that the usul is that when you marry someone it's treated as intercourse so marriage is usually treated as intercourse and owning someone either through uh, a slave or a slave girl is not treated or primarily understood as intercourse but rather it's understood as khidma so you have that sister or that woman as a khadima okay so let's begin inshallah ta'ala so the author says and let's begin with the first scenario wala yajma'u bayna al-ukhtayni nikahan you're not to combine two sisters through nikah wala بملك يمين وطء نو فرو لوفل اونرشيب بيرميتينج انتركورس ان هي برينجز ان تو فيرسز فروم ذا قران وان تجمعوا بين الاختين which is obviously the strongest proof that you take two sisters and then is a hadith of the prophet peace be upon him is part of a, a larger tradition of the prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم uh, where he says من كان يؤمن بالله واليوم الآخر فلا يجمعنا معه في رحم أختين. Whoever believes in God and the last day should not gather his water in the wombs of two sisters. Okay, so there are a number of scenarios and I'll just highlight them for you. Now, usually when you marry two sisters or you try to marry two sisters, would be probably an accurate way of describing this is that you might marry them both at the same time in one instance. This is flat out batil, combining two contracts into one. You're not allowed to do this. So flat out, this is batil. What might happen is that you might marry one sister, uh, which is perfectly valid. And then uh, because marriage is understood as intercourse here, uh, you try to marry the second one. The first one will stand, the second one is invalid. Okay. Now, when it comes to owning two sisters, you might find yourself in a scenario, somebody might find themselves in a scenario uh, where they own two sisters. Because in ownership, the ownership is not understood as for intercourse. You can own two, but as long as uh, intercourse does not take place with both of them, only one of them. Okay. So the idea here is, is that you don't do jama between two sisters. When you own one or you own two, uh, you're only allowed to have what you would want. Otherwise, you're falling foul of the verse here in the Quran and the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The second scenario, and I'll read the Arabic for you. فَإِن تَزَوَّجَ أُخْتَ أَمَةٍ لَهُ قَدْ وَطِئَهَا So if he marries a sister of the slave, so he marries a sister of the slave with whom he has had intercourse with. Sahan nikah, the nikah is valid. Bisudurihi min ahlihi mudafan ila mahallahi. So uh, this is completely valid uh, if he marries the sister of the slave girl of his with whom he has had intercourse. Uh, the nikah is valid because the issuance of the offer and acceptance by eligible parties. For subject matter that is lawful, this is perfectly fine. Let me explain this to you, inshallah. So, here you have a diagram. So, for example, here's a person, the man, and he owns sister A and he's had intercourse with her. So, haqiqatan, he's had intercourse with her, sister A. Now, then he decides that the sister B, who is um, freed, who is now freed. And then he wants to marry sister B. So the sister B becomes his wife. Who wants to become his wife. Not his slave, but what becomes his wife. So he says, well, first and foremost, is this nikah contract valid? And the fuqaha say, yes, this is a perfectly valid contract. There's nothing wrong with this. Of course, when he marries her, hukman, even though he might not have had intercourse with her, hukman, um, he's understood to have um, been in a situation where uh, intercourse could happen. So then he has to do something. This is what the fuqaha is saying. وَإِذَا جَازَ وَإِذَا جَازَ لَا يَتَعُ الْأَمَةَ So when this is permissible, when he's allowed to marry sister B, 
we cannot have intercourse with the uh, sister A. Wa in kana lam mankuha, even though he hasn't had intercourse with um, the one he has married. لأن المنكوحة موطوءة حكما because sister B is understood from a legal perspective to be someone that he can have intercourse with. So very much straightforward. And then he continues ولا يطع المنكوحة للجمع and he can't have intercourse with sister he's just my sister B because if he does that he's doing jama, right? And this is where the problem falls in lil uh, so what does he do he has to act illa idha harrab al mawtu'ata ala nafsihi he has to make sister a the one who he has had haqiqi literal intercourse with haram upon himself by using various ways gifting her giving her away and so forth fa hina izin yata al mankuha then he can have intercourse with his sister uh, her sister or the sister be the one that he is married. Li admil jam'i because there's no jama' now. He's made her haram. Because remember, sister A is for khadiba. Her primary role is a khadima. Uh, and so now he's 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 given her away or he's made her haram um, upon himself. And so he's only got sister B, the one that he is married. Li admil jam'i wata wa yata'u mankuhata illam yakun watil mamlukata li admil jam'i wata'a. So this is uh, just explaining that uh, you can't join between two sisters except that if he does it through some form of prohibition. Now if he hasn't had intercourse with sister A, so it might be this scenario where nothing has happened with sister A, then he doesn't have to do anything. He doesn't have to do anything with sister A. Uh, sister B that he's married, he's allowed to have intercourse with her because there's no jama' here. Neither hakikatan and no hukman. That's what the Sheikh is saying. That's what the author is um, saying uh, for our benefit, inshallah ta'ala. So I think that's quite easy. I don't think there's anything difficult for any of us uh, to appreciate. So if you go back to this scenario, to this scenario again, you can clearly see that he's had intercourse with her. So this one, he can marry her. But then what he has to do is before he does anything, he has to Prohibit A, so you're not combining, okay? Because you can't join two sisters. Now, if he hasn't had any intercourse with sister A, there's nothing that's happened. He's married sister B, who's be who's become his wife, if you like. She's the wife. Then there's nothing to be done because there was no intercourse in the first place. I hope this is very, very straightforward. If you have any questions, so, please do ask. Here's another scenario, very, very interesting. The sheikh says, فَإِن تَزَوَّجَ So number three here. فَإِن تَزَوَّجَ أُخْتَيْنِ فِي أُخْتَتَيْنِ If he marries two sisters in two separate contracts. Remember the reason the author is mentioning two separate contracts is because of what we said here. Right? If it was done in one contract, um, it would have been battled anyway. But what happens in this scenario is that someone's married two sisters in two separate contracts. But the problem is this. وَلَا يُدْرَ he doesn't know which one he married first. They will both be separated from him. Why is that? We know that one of the two is invalid with, with, without a doubt. You can't have both at the same time. So one is definitely void. But we can't decide which one. We don't have a way of knowing which one did he marry first. لِأَدْمِلْ أَوْلَوِيَّةِ We don't know which one he married first. وَلَا إِلَى تَنْفِيذِ مَعَ التَّجْهِيلِ And even if we try to do something, where we you know we just kind of do some guesswork, it's done with jahala, it's done with ignorance. And we don't like that as jurists. We don't like to just speculate. لِأَدْمِلْ فَائِدَةِ There's no benefit in doing this. Or there might be some harm if you, you know, if you let one marry and the other one can't marry. Well, she is in this really odd situation. Is she? What's her situation now? What happens to her? How? Who's supposed to look after her? So you're creating harm for the women. Remember, the Sharia is absolutely obsessed with making sure 
no one is ever harmed. La darar wa la dira. Don't cause harm. Uh, and don't you know? Don't don't cause harm to anyone. Don't become the means of harm to other people. So the Sharia is very much um, taking this position. Fata'ayn at tafriq. So what do we do? We just have to go to the situation where we say, "I'm really sorry, uh, but we'll have you. We'll have to ask both of you to be separated." What about the mahar? The mahar, the dowry that's given. So the, here it says, "Walahuma," both of them, i.e., the both. Of these sisters, he says, will get um, half the mahar, nisful mahar, لأنه وجب للأولى منهما وانعامة الأولوية للجهل بالأولوية فيصرف إليهما. So, if you remember, just to quickly take you to another slide, which might be useful. Give me a second. If you remember, what usually happens, and this is just a quick recap. Uh, when marriage happens, uh, the dowry is sometimes stipulated in the contract, sometimes it's not stipulated in the contract. The one the offer is following is when you stipulate it in the contract, and then what happens is divorce is pronounced or separation is happens. If it happens prior to actual intercourse or there's no prevention uh, or of a physical or religious way of engaging in intercourse, then you'll give half. Yeah. So this is the scenario that you're looking at. Uh, if it's done, uh, if the if the mahar was stipulated in contract, and um, uh, there was uh, this happened after intercourse, then you give the full full mahar. So this is taken from the Quran. There are other scenarios which I'm not going to into, but here he's talking about the scenario where the mahar is stipulated in the contract, and this happens prior to actual intercourse. So I just wanted to show you this so you're kind of clear. And let's go back to our scenario here. So what happens is, uh, basically, the mahar, half of it, it will be halved. And one quarter will go to one sister, and one quarter will go to the other sister. That's basically um, the scenario, because it was the mahar is actually due to the first sister of the two. But we don't have a way of prioritizing. We don't have information. So what we do is we just pay them equally, okay? And some ulama say that what they should do is they should file a claim with the judge um, and say, you know, I was the first, and they should come to some sort of negotiated settlement because it's not known uh, who is entitled to it. That's really, really interesting. I want to share something else with you, if I may, inshallah ta'ala. And that is um, that amongst the Jews, there seems to be some sort of debate around this mahar question. So let me, uh, if I may, and this is not in the Hidayah, but you might find this uh, useful nonetheless. Okay, so here's a scenario. Now, in the Sharh of Imam Tahtawi, um, that it says, so I'm going to put this as number one. This is the one that Sahibi Hidayah has taken. He says that وَيَلْزَمُ عَلَى الزَّوْجِ نِسْفُ الْمَهْرِ The husband needs to give half. Okay. فَيَكُونُ بَيْنَهُمَا So both the sisters A and B will get a quarter and a quarter. Another scenario, uh, and this is narrated from Imam Abu Yusuf, and I'll just denote him as AY, Imam Abu Yusuf, may Allah be pleased with him. He says that nothing. لا يجب على الزوج شيء nothing doesn't need to give anything and I'll give you another position and this is from Imam Muhammad denoted with the M here and he says ثم قال وروي عن محمد رحمه الله تعالى أنه قال يجب عليه المهر لكل واحد كاملا so each one of them will get كامل i.e. she will get um, so if you think about sister A and sister B, they will both get a full mahar. These are different scenarios that um, some of the Judas give. I'm not really interested in the the question here. What I'm more interested is in the reasoning. Okay, and I want to show you that um, in fiqh, we do have this idea that there's differences of opinion. Uh, scholars can come to different forms of reasoning. So I want to show you what I would call modes of reasoning very very important less interested in the answer for now 
uh, but more interested in the answer that we actually reach. Okay, so uh, let's look at this one. Wajhu uh, riwayat nisf, the reason for giving half. Wahiya riwayat al asal. This is mentioned in the asal um, of um, the which is known as the asal of ma'roof, which is known as the mabsud of Imam Muhammad Shaybani, rahimahullahu taala. As for that one, uh, it's in Kitab al Nikah. Anna nikah ihda huma sahihun bi infiradin. One of them, we know for a fact that it's sahih. One of the nikahs we know uh, is sahih for a fact. But the second wife, we don't know. But we know that hers is fasid. So one is one, one nikah is sahih, one nikah is fasid. وَقَدْ حَصَلَ التَّفْرِيقُ بَيْنَ الزَّوْجِ وَبَيْنَ السَّحِيِّ النِّكَاءِ قَبْلَ الدُّخُولِ And you separated... Uh, both, uh, you separated um, them before any duhul has happened. Remember why I said this means that in this case, in normal scenario, she would get half the mahar. فَيَنْتَصِفُ mahar. So you would uh, divide the mahar into two parts, half. وَلَيْسَ الْإِحْدَاهُمَا بِأَوْلَى مِنَ الْأُخْرَى فَاشْتَرَعَ So we don't know who is more worthy than the other one, so we just give her half. I hope that reasoning makes sense. Because we just can't have a way of knowing. This is one position. and Muhammad. So this is the position that I've just mentioned. Now is the one that's mentioned in the kitab that we just studied. As for um, the position that's mentioned from Imam Muhammad, The husband is recognizing that one of the nikahs, one of the contracts is valid. And he hasn't given her talaq. Right? He hasn't given her talaq, so he should give all of it. So this is the position of him, Imam Muhammad. He says, well, he hasn't really given, because the husband himself is doing iqrar, that one of them is, um, that, he, that he did nikah with, um, and he hasn't given her talaq. He hasn't been able to give her the talaq. So, so what he's doing, he's doing iqrar nikah He's doing iqrar that I have. He's recognized I've married one of them. And he hasn't given her talaq. So he should give her the tamam of the mahar, the entire mahar. As for Imam Abu Yusuf, the middle one here, he says, There's a lot of ambiguity here. So it's like when one person says to two people, لِأَحْدِكُمَا عَلَيْهِ أَلْفُ So he's, he, it's like one person here, and he says to two people, just draw it out for you. I've got to give you a thousand, maybe a thousand pounds. He said that to them. There's nothing wajib here. He doesn't need to give it. Because who, because there's lam yajib shaitan. To who? Who is he talking to? Person A, person B. Has he mentioned who? We don't know. He just said, um, I've got to give a thousand. Kaza, kaza, kaza. Kaza, haza. This is the way it is, he says. So if you read it like that, you should say, I'm sorry, 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 And the separation from the Qazi side is like giving talaq from the husband side. There's no meaning for here of him saying that no, he hasn't given her talaq. Um, so this is just um, ways of reasoning how different Judas come to different views. I hope you found that useful. It's just a way of thinking through these masail. As always, these, these, these things are very, very fascinating. It requires a lot of thinking as you can see and as you can, um, you know, as you can imagine, inshallah ta'ala. Okay. All right. I hope you found that useful. Uh, any questions, please do come back to me and I look forward to hearing from you very soon. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi. وبركاته